This week's podcast is sponsored by the book, Glory Lost and Found, How Delta Climbed from Despair to Dominance in the Post-9-11 Era. It's Delta's inspirational turnaround story, written by the editors of Airline Weekly. Lively and informative, just like this podcast. Available in hardcover, paperback, Kindle, and audiobook formats. Hop on Amazon.com and search Delta Book. America might have its best new airline prospect in 20 years. And it's being founded by the same guy who launched that last successful startup. Meanwhile, we talked back in March about how things were getting rough for airlines in Mexico. They were getting pounded by the peso, and seat capacity there has been outpacing rather tepid economic growth. Together, that made for a pretty mediocre 2017. But how did Mexico do in the first quarter of 2018? Seth, have things gotten any better? Eh, not really. Real quick, here are the operating profit margins for the four big airlines there. You might want to have the children cover their ears. Interjet's Q1 operating profit margin was negative 11%. Viva Aerobus was negative 10%. Aeromexico more or less broke even. And Valaris posted a negative 15% operating profit margin. I'm Jason Cottrell, Vice President of Airline Weekly. And I'm Seth Kaplan, Managing Partner of Airline Weekly. We're going to dig into those scary Mexico numbers a little further. We'll check in on India's Indigo, who's also facing some turbulence. Plus, we have some mildly bad news from Southwest and Delta, all coming up in the Airline Weekly Lounge. Thanks for joining us. We'll talk in a little while about whether David Nealman still has his moxie. But first, Mexico's airline sector had a pretty ghastly first quarter, except for Aeromexico. Earlier in the year, we touched on how Aeromexico is weathering the storm better than their local competitors. That seemed to be the case again the first quarter. Yeah, and the story here seems to be that the you know, domestic situation is is still awful. And Aeromexico is just better positioned to to run from that. Uh, than others, you know, and in fact, if you, if you say, well, you know, how fast is it growing as an airline? 15%. Okay. That sounds pretty fast, uh, you know, for, for an airline that's, you know, feeling the kind of pressure that it is, but, but the breakdown is, is really wild. International ASKs available C kilometers up 26%. I mean, so you're talking about one of the you know, fastest growing international airlines in the world among uh, among sizable airlines. Uh, domestically, it, it, it shrunk 5%. Uh, so, so just kind of a, a tale of, of two different parts of its network. And that's how it managed to, you know, more or less tread water again, you know, right around break even this year compared to to last year. You know, its revenues were up 15% year over year. Operating costs, if you exclude the special items, up just 12%. And, and so that, you know, shows you how it was able to sort of uh, uh, do about as well, actually, you know, fractionally better than, uh, than a year earlier. Uh, the peso, by the way, um, during the first quarter, I mean, uh, under pressure for, for, you know, much of the past uh, year, year and a half or so, uh, was actually up uh, on average slightly compared to a year earlier. Uh, you know, that too was helpful. And the Delta joint venture, um, you know, just getting going and, and every reason to think it, that too will be helpful. Aeromexico by, Aeromexico, by the way, likes to talk about how it, it's become a more reliable airline. So maybe that too, uh, a feature of, of, of Delta, something it's bragged about a lot in recent years, justifiably so. The two now working together uh, in important ways, including operationally, maintenance areas, that kind of thing. And, and so uh, Aeromexico too, uh, a better operator than, than it previously was. And what about the three others who all had negative profit margins in the double digits? Do any of them do any of them have more hope than the others? You know, we're all about hope in the airline weekly lounge. They all, I guess, if if you want to say, you know, sort of the trends, Interjet at least uh, didn't slip compared to last year in terms of its uh, it, its its operating margin. Now it was negative eleven percent, so it was it was nothing good, but at least the the trends there. Were, were better than at the other two, uh, which both uh, slipped a bit. Interjet is the upmarket low cost carrier there, one that looks, I mean, just broadly speaking, a little more like an airline like JetBlue, let's say, generous legroom, that sort of thing. Uh, a fast growing airline. Uh, you know, its ASK capacity grew 26% for an airline that's, that's, 
you know, mostly a domestic airline, but it does have the international routes to the uh, to the near abroad. Um, it, it's somewhat protected by the fact that Mexico City's main airport is its busiest market, and uh, that's that's a congested airport um, where other competitors can't just pile in with new capacity, and, and that did protect it somewhat and, you know, it might've been enough to sort of explain why, uh, as I said, it managed to, to at least hold its own compared to where it was a year earlier, which to be clear is not a, not a very good place. Viva Aerobus, negative 10% margin. That was a deterioration from, uh, negative 8% last year, you know, an airline with exposure to more of those other markets where, you know, they're not as capacity constrained and, other airlines can add capacity. In fact, you know, ever since Open Skies, uh, yeah, there's there's been some new capacity to Mexico from the U.S., and that's something that Volaris also exposed to. And uh, yeah, those you mentioned it in the intro, uh, a negative fifteen percent operating margin for Volaris. I mean, look, it's not going to be that bad all year, um, but that's that's a pretty bad way to to start the year. That was uh, a bit worse than negative fourteen percent. A year earlier, and and that's because of uh, just just that awful domestic uh, uh, fare environment. Uh, Valara said ticket yields were down twelve percent. It blamed overcapacity, you know, just the supply situation, uncertainty uh, regarding the upcoming election uh, in in Mexico, tighter U.S. immigration policies, uh, concerns about NAFTA. Anyway, you add it all up, and yeah, a, a bad quarter, just just a question of degree to varying degrees for all three. Of of Mexico's low cost carriers, you know, Mexico the one again is 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 just best positioned to uh, to fly far abroad to to escape uh, the the woes uh, domestically and in the short haul market. And how worried are Mexico's carriers about Mexico City's new airport construction? Construction is underway, but there is a chance it will be stopped. Uh, yeah, depending on what happens in the presidential election, the uh, the populist candidate Andres uh, Manuel López Obrador says that he will uh, will stop construction there. You know, we'll see if that would actually happen. You know, he leads in the polls, uh, so so yeah, a lot of uncertainty there, and the impact would be different um, for different airlines. You, you know, the ones that have those coveted slots at the congested current airport for them, you know, it is kind of a a, a mixed blessing. Uh, you know, in the sense that. Heathrow expansion, a new runway at Heathrow will be a, you know kind of a mixed story for an airline like British Airways that has such a strong presence there. Uh, so, so if you are uh, Aeromexico, if you are Interjet with a nice position at, at the current airport, um, you know you might like to be able to expand, but you also recognize that that would mean low comp- new competition. If you're the other airlines, you know who just don't have much of a presence at the new airport, uh, you're probably even more concerned about the prospect of. Uh, per, there perhaps not being a new airport because you know you're looking uh, to, to 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 get into Mexico City in a way that that you're not there right now. Moving north of the border, a Seattle newspaper reporter asked Alaska Airlines CEO Brad Tilden whether Alaska would buy Hawaiian Airlines if it ever became available. Tilden, unsurprisingly, didn't say much in response. Probably didn't want to fuel wild speculation. Uh, but we can sure do that. Seth, would an Alaska Hawaiian merger make any sense? It's interesting. You know, it, it's something um, I, I've thought about in the past, just kind of when you're playing, you know, fantasy baseball airline style, you know, what, what would work? I mean, you, you know, the, these are, uh, yeah, the airlines from the, the, the 49th and 50th states, right? The named after those states. Uh, that's not too important. You, you know, it, it's, it's a, if you if you merge those two networks, you could see how there is some overlap, which typically is good. Uh, you know, when you're merging airlines, you you know they compete against each other between Hawaii and and, uh, and the West Coast, um, but then they would each add things to 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 each other. It'd be quite a force across the Pacific, right? I mean, what do you call the thing? Trans Pacific Airlines or something? Um, it, it's it's uh, you know if you think about that, uh, you know Alaska. Now uh, under all kinds of pressure uh, after the Virgin America merger, would still provide some some you know some interesting new exposure, the, the strength in the Pacific Northwest that sells the, posi- uh, the best position there, an excellent position in the West Coast in general. Uh, you know, Hawaiian's been doing well in recent years, but you know, kind of a one trick pony, an airline that's that's you know uh, vulnerable to new capacity in Hawaii or just to anything that goes wrong in 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 uh, in, in that one market. Um, so you know, you can. 
you, you could you could understand the uh, temptation. Um, on the other hand, Alaska is an all narrow body carrier. We've talked before on this show how all narrow body carriers tend to be more profitable than than uh, than airlines that have uh, wide bodies. The Hawaiian, of course, has 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 a mix of both. And, and Alaska, look, I just said it. Still digesting what uh, financially, at least, has not been an easy merger. They've done a good job operationally putting together the reservation systems and that sort of thing, but it's really been a drag so far on on uh, on the company. When, when you look at yeah this 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 uh, list we ran in in last week's issue of sort of the top ten gainers and decliners among the world's airlines in terms of their first quarter profit margins. Alaska was right at uh, number two on the list, down 10 points. And we were talking, I don't know, 70 airlines or so that we're looking at. So, uh, you know, not sure that they right now would have the stomach for another merger. By the way, in case, you're, in case you're wondering, because I did look this up, I said, would it have to be Alaska buying Hawaiian and not the other way around? Yeah, Alaska in terms of market capitalization is, is the far you know the far bigger airline, something like four times the size by market cap. So it, it's the one that would have to do the uh, the buying with Hawaiian uh, as as the small the, the far smaller airline uh, being this. I don't expect it to happen, um, but it's uh, but it's 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 not a crazy question. When you play fantasy baseball airlines, <laughs> have you dreamed up any mergers that you think should happen? Not saying they will, just that they should. Um, have you come up with any? Well, look, in, in the US, Frontier Spirit is the other one that's kind of always out there. I mean, that's not me saying anything brilliant. That's, you know, I think there are a lot of people in the industry who who think it's more a question of when than if, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see if that uh, ever comes to pass, you know, if, if, uh, if it would happen before a Frontier IPO. Right now, Frontier is still privately owned by Indigo Partners or if they would take it public and then, you know, the, the two could do it. Um and uh, you know, the potential synergies are obvious. They're just similar business models and and all the rest of it. You know, uh, Spirit has kind of been drifting in a little bit of a different direction, and you wonder the more they do that, you know, kind of a little bit away from the uh, from sort of the the strict ultra low cost carrier model. Um, certainly, if they were to like take out another fleet type, which they've expressed some interest in doing, that that would. I think make a merger quite a bit less likely. Um, but you know, that's, that's, that's the one, um, that's, that's, uh, perhaps out there. Although I would not be at all surprised if something else happens, of course, somewhere in the world, uh, before that one. Okay. Back to reality in India, (laughs) what is going wrong at Indigo? Uh, This was the darling of Indian airspace not too long ago, but in last week's airline weekly, as you mentioned, we noted the biggest decliners year over year and Indigo was, I think in the top five. Yeah, it was number one. Uh, It was, it was the the only one worse than, uh, than Alaska airlines down 14%, uh, did 14 points year over year in terms of its, uh, its operating margin. Uh, so yeah, quite a a dramatic fall from grace. I mean, look, a lot's gone on there. I mean, India is a tough market. Uh, the rupee, the local currency, has been declining uh, related to you know higher oil prices. That's all almost always unhelpful for uh, for local airlines anywhere when that happens. But yeah, it was eleven percent the margin in 2016 for that quarter, first quarter, and fourteen percent in 2017, all the way down to break even, just about break even in 2018. Uh, costs were up thirty percent. I mean, driven partly by higher fuel prices, revenues only up twenty percent. So you know, you can imagine it, it has faced disruptions from A320 Neo delivery delays. Uh, yeah, it's beyond its control. But yeah, this is an airline that is uh, you know. Used to look a lot like Southwest. Um, you know, I mean, that is a compliment. You know, one fleet type, a uh, lot of frequencies, and not too many markets. Kind of as business friendly schedules. And uh, look, now it's taking ATR Turbo props. You know, with all due respect to those, which can be great little planes for the right kind of airline. You know, when you're running that sort of business friendly LCC, and then all of a sudden you're taking Turbo props. Uh, and sure, yeah, they're serving subsidized regional routes. Uh, you know, sort of incentivized, maybe prodded by the government, um, you know, starting to look like somewhat of a different airline. And, um, you know, we'll see if they can climb back out of this. But certainly, yeah, in the meantime, uh, an airline that was really one of the world's um, superstars uh, for a little while there, and, 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 and particularly a star in a tough market like India, where other airlines struggle to sort of profit consistently, this was a, a consistently profitable airline, and, and even you know among the more impressive ones in the world, and, and one that's now struggling certainly relative to its own history. Jet Airways was also one of the Q1 laggards. Operating profit margin was down seven percent year over year. Are they handling the fuel situation any better than Indigo? 
Uh, yeah, and I mean, this is an airline that that uh, didn't have as much cushion to begin with. So yeah, that seven point decline was less than the decline at, at Indigo. So that might sound like good news. Um, but the problem is that it was so what things were so much worse to begin with that whereas Indigo, as I mentioned, kind of broke even. Uh, Jet Airways a negative nine percent operating margin. So sure, fuel costs up twenty nine percent year over year. Uh, that was unhelpful when revenues rose just eight percent. It's it's tough, right? Um, n- now you know reasons for hope for this airline. It's still a quarter owned by Etihad, but it's not sort of as strategically influenced anymore. Kind of coming more into the fold of particularly Air France KLM, uh, but also that company's partners, Virgin Atlantic. Delta, B737 Maxes uh, start coming next month. Uh, cargo revenues surging as, as they had for a lot of other airlines in Jet's case up 17%. And this is another place I remember what I said about Mexico City um, a few minutes ago, you know, Mumbai, which is Jet's uh, top airport, uh, is is a very constrained airport where you know, you, nobody else can just come in and start service. Now, uh, you know, I'm sure Jet would like to do some things that it can't do, um, but on the other hand, that does uh, keep away uh, competition. So, so probably at least as much a a, a strength as a vulnerability that it has uh, a good position at that airport. But something's going to need to change for this airline, which is uh, still struggling to turn the corner. Is Indigo seriously thinking about going international with wide bodies? That sounds precarious to me. Is is that a good idea? Uh, they're they seem very serious, uh, and I mean, you know, we've talked about it on here. Um, just really hard to come up with examples of that uh, that working. You know, it's it's uh, you know, I don't know. WestJet says that that uh, you know things are seem to be going well so far, but all I know is that they. You know, and other airlines that do that when you take these short haul narrow body airlines, uh, single aisle airlines, and start flying abroad and start doing it with, with twin engine, uh, tw- twin aisle aircraft, wide body aircraft, their margins just never seem to increase. Um, you know, alongside them doing that, so uh, so we'll see. Uh, you, you can understand the temptation, um, especially with that brutal domestic market. You know, they they have to tread carefully. Uh, you know, the history is 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 not good when you have airlines like that start trying to go too far abroad all i have to do ask is ask look sabu pacific there's another example right wildly profitable airline in a lot of regards couldn't make long haul work uh, you know, air asia x is you know doing better than it was but it's not doing well uh, you know within the fold of a broader company that you know generally has done very well short haul just over and over and over again too many examples like that and hard hard to think of very many of, of uh, you know the opposite that we're where the experiment has gone well. We wrote last week in Airline Weekly a bit about the financial damage Southwest endured after temporarily suspending its marketing in the wake of the fatality in April. The part that interested me was the idea that Southwest suspending its marketing would be a, would be harder on Southwest than most other carriers. That's because Southwest depends more on that marketing to drive bookings than other airlines. You know, if you think of marketing by other airlines, a lot of times it's sort of this this branding kind of thing, make you feel good about the airline. Those airlines have other ways of driving bookings, uh, specifically in in the U.S. Almost every other airline, Allegiant is, is really the exception here, but almost every other airline is in the online travel agencies. So even if you've never heard of that airline, uh, you know, if you're looking to fly from one place to another and that airline offers service, uh, you're, you're going to see that airline show up. Uh, and with Southwest, that's not the case. And you might think, well, who hasn't heard of Southwest? But you know, there are a lot of markets where, although they're a rather large airline overall uh, domestically, markets where you know, people aren't going to think about Southwest necessarily, uh, you know, big cities in particular, Boston or, or uh, you know, New York. These are places where Southwest is present, but they're a tiny part of the market. And, and uh, you know, most people, especially if they're not frequent flyers, if they're jumping on an online travel agency, you know, Expedia or Priceline or whatever, uh, just to search for flights, they're not going to see Southwest show up there. And so, you know, Southwest spends the most on advertising, not a coincidence. You know, they they like to think about how they have very low distribution costs because they don't distribute more broadly because they're not paying all kinds of fees and commissions. But uh, you pay one way or another. And in their case, they pay for advertising. And when they have to stop advertising, uh, yeah, for them to the degree that that advertising is required to remind people to go straight to southwest.com, when they're not doing that, that's more of an issue of for them than it is for you know really just about any other U.S. airline if, if, if one of those other airlines were to uh, stop advertising. 
Let's talk a little bit about the second quarter, which of course doesn't end for a couple of weeks. Still, both Delta and Southwest have made some bearish statements on that quarter. In short, it sounds like revenues are just fine, but as good as they are, costs continue to carry the day. Yeah, you've got this race always really, right? Between revenues and costs in either direction. And and now we're back in a situation where where revenues, when you think back a couple of years ago, revenues were declining steeply, but costs were declining too because fuel was going down. Now, uh, you know, revenues, everybody seems to feel pretty good. They've stabilized going up, you know, revenues for a lot of airlines, um, but so are their costs. You know, it's driven by fuel costs, of course. Fuel costs right now kind of off their highs recently, but still, still a lot higher than they were uh, over the past few years. And uh, labor costs, these airlines are all, all getting be given big raises to their employees. And uh, so, yeah, they, they have uh, cost issues. Delta in particular is, is just a great example of an airline with a really strong revenue picture, but uh, but concerned about costs. With Southwest, they've also taken that little bit of a hit to revenues because of w- what we just talked about a minute ago. Uh, you know, that 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 issue you know, with the passenger fatality and then having to, to stop advertising for a while or at least feeling like they had to uh, led to, you know, maybe more bookaways than you would have expected for an airline that overall has the kind of reputation that Southwest has for for uh, for for safety uh, but maybe you know some small number of bookaways just because of you know the negative publicity but then also you know that compounded by them not being able to drive bookings as much as they usually do in the way that they're accustomed to doing it and the big story out this week in an exclusive airline weekly cover story David Nealman, the man who brought us JetBlue and then founded Azul down in Brazil, is coming back to America. The new airline is slated to be called Moxie. Yeah, a a CS300 operator, apparently up to 60 of those uh, by the time you get several years out. Uh, Looks like they want to launch in in 2020 uh, using alternative airports. You know, Providence is one that uh, you know. Looking at at, uh, at what we saw, they've they've named as a, as an example of one. I mean, they haven't announced obviously they haven't announced anything. You know, they don't seem to have nailed down a route network necessarily. But looking at those alternative airports with uh, yeah, these CS three hundreds, which you know, Bombardier struggled to get going, but everybody. I mean, they seem to be great planes configured with between 120 and 145 seats, maybe different configurations for longer haul versions and shorter haul versions. Point to point network. They say they're not going to sell connections. So in that regard, different from most other U.S. airlines. Allegiant really is the only one you can think of that doesn't sell any connections. And so, uh, you know, they think they're going to have very low costs you know, because of these efficient aircraft, because of the alternative airports. And, and I mean, look, just kind of most you know, prosaically, but but importantly, I mean, just being a new airline does tend to give you a very low cost structure because you've got a completely junior workforce at this long at this point. It's been so long since there's been another new airline. Uh, you know, really, JetBlue was the last successful new startup. It's going to be 20 years old by the time this one launches, and so uh, yeah, a big advantage there when you're starting with all new employees. So it's uh, it's, it's going to be interesting, and it, it's been a while. Uh, you know, Virgin America was kind of the last sort of exciting new airline. Uh, I mean, it survived, got absorbed by Alaska. Hard to call it, though, a bang-up success. I mean, it, it, let's go back and have it. I think if you added up all the earnings from all the years, they probably didn't, you know, probably didn't break even. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, it's been a long time since there's been a new airline, uh, the, 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 a successful new airline. And so we'll see if this one uh, can be that one. How big of a deal is it that it's Nealman? A new entrant is always exciting to geeks like us, but Nealman seems to add a certain level of interest. Am I imagining things? No, you're right. You're right. Uh, you know, I mean, first of all, that attracts capital. They save $100 million already. I mean, so that's 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 a big deal. I mean, he has a track record. Uh, not that he's never made mistakes. Look, even JetBlue after a while, it was they, they felt you know, the board there felt time for new blood, but uh, you know, generally speaking, he's been he's been right more than more than he's been wrong. So no, uh, that that of course give, gives gives it a certain credibility. You know the, the the part when I look at all of it that I'm that maybe a little more skeptical about than others is the the alternative airports. I mean, certainly there's, there, there's a role for those. You know, they see all this opportunity there. I look at it and say, well, you know, like let's take Providence because we mentioned it. You know. Southwest has slashed their um, presence there. Uh, and Southwest is an airline. It's very well structured to 
operate at airports like those. I mean, there's 737 700s really have the same capacity as that. Uh, I mentioned the CS 300s. It looks like on the short haul version, Moxie's looking at I don't know, 145 seats. Southwest 700s have 143 seats. You know, so the same kind of capacity. And yet, uh, and an airline that likes low airport costs, I mean, it's not like they have a bias against those airports. I mean, that was their model. And, and you just have kind of seen them recently just believing that there's just so much revenue at the primary airport, so much more revenue that they've done whatever they can to kind of pivot away, even though they still serve a lot of those, those, uh, those secondary airports. That part, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see, um, you know, harder to stimulate traffic sometimes from those places. Uh, look, they're probably gonna have a great cost structure. Uh, they're probably going to be a, a really well-managed airline and, um, you know, they, they can adapt. I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, you know, the, the, the you know, some airports of course are, are very crowded and hard to get into, but, um, you know, if they find that markets aren't working, it's, you know, these are airplanes, you can, you can fly them somewhere else. And what do you think about the timing? Does does America need another airline and is does America have enough room for another airline? Well, these airlines, the existing airlines are very profitable, right? So that tells you uh, that um, uh, we, in the cover story, we covered uh, the Jeff Bezos of Amazon. His, his, uh, uh, we, we, he has this famous quote is, your margin is my opportunity, right? Well, these airlines are earning billions and billions of dollars right now. And so, you know, that's that seems to be the thinking here is that uh, that that uh, that there is room. You, know, you wonder, well, why hasn't there been another startup? And I think part of it is that um, even though on one hand, sure, it seems like opportunity in an industry is doing so well. On the other hand, you're talking about a situation. This is different from how it used to be. I mean, the smallest notable airline, let's say you know, Frontier Legion, the uh, uh, Spirit, OK, I guess Allegiant is one of, the, of those that has the uh, the least airplanes. What is that? What is that? 90 airplanes. So to achieve the scale, even if you think you're going to have low cost, you know, if you're going to start an airline with 10 or 20 airplanes, uh, you're probably not going to have the scale to get your cost down to where they're competitive against those incumbents, even though they have, you know, older cost structures and you're starting with junior employees. Uh, so if, if uh, Moxie can get up to, you know, 60 airplanes in a few years and, you know, rather efficient airplanes and all of that. Um, I think that's the difference here. Uh, so, you know, let's see if they can do it. Yeah. I mean, this, this, this is, uh, the most intriguing possibility, no question that we've seen in, in, uh, in a lot of years, along with you know, all those other crackpot ideas that come and go, uh, you know, the airlines that never, in most cases end up seeing the, the, the light of day. And I've seen, believe me, I've, I've seen and been been pitched uh, all kinds of ideas uh and uh you know we, we wouldn't be writing about this if, if, if we didn't take it seriously very exciting indeed thanks for listening to episode 99 of the airline weekly lounge by the way if you like the show share it with your colleagues they can subscribe to the airline weekly lounge through itunes titch uh, itunes titcher and stitcher <laughs> <laughs> or wherever they get their podcasts. They can also subscribe at airlineweekly.com. Hope to see you back here for episode 100. Woo!